Good morning. Good morning. How is everyone today? Welcome to church. And for those of you at home, welcome. Thank you for having us in your living room. And if you have any prayer requests, please just send them through on our page and someone will be praying for you during the service. Thank you. We're just going to look at a few verses. We're going to take off straight from where Pastor Jim left off last week. And to really get what Paul is saying, we're going to have to look at it a couple of Greek words. So um, I can pretty much promise you that I will mispronounce them. So um, instead of apologising to you every time I attempt a Greek word, let's just say this is my, my blanket apology over every attempt at Greek and you will forgive me every time. So thank you. So if you're in Ephesians 5, we're going to begin to read from verse 15. Uh, Jim finished off last week at verse 14. So verse 15, just for a few verses, here we go. It says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise. And this is Paul speaking to the church in Ephesus and then also speaking to the whole church, which includes us. Verse 16, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Take over here this morning. Overcome my weakness in the name of Jesus. So let's first look at verse 15. It says this, be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Don't live unwise, live wise. Now, there's two things I think we should look at here. Firstly, he says, be careful then how you live. Other versions will say, so be careful how you live. So why then? Why so? Because Paul is referring back to what has just been said. So last week, Pastor Jim spoke about how Paul was telling us we are people of light. Remember, Ephesians goes to, a lot of, goes to a lot of length, a lot of trouble, so that we understand we are people who belong to God. We are the children of God, and we are people of light. Paul spends such a large part of this epistle to the Ephesians, this epistle to the whole church, saying, please know who you are in God, because everything flows out of that. And in last week, Jim was really bringing out all the stuff about how saying, you are people of light. We live in this world, but as Jesus said in John chapter 10, we are in the world, but we're not of it. We live in this world, but we live in this world as people of light. So it's referring back, referencing back to where we were before. So everything from here on in is based on that foundational truth, we are children of light. Everything you hear this morning, everything you continue to read in the book of Ephesians is based in that foundational truth, we are people of light. When you have Jesus, you are a person of light. When you have Jesus, you are a child of God. When you, are, when you have Jesus, you are in the kingdom of light. You have been removed from a kingdom of darkness, placed into the kingdom of light. You are a child, you are a person of light. The second thing I think to look at here in verse 15, it says, be caref he says, be careful how you live. Because as people of light, we should live as people of light. Amen? We should live as if we are people of light. Our lives should demonstrate that we are people who belong to the God of light. Now, I just want to say, don't ever let anybody convince you that because of grace, it doesn't matter how you do things. Don't ever let anyone convince you 
that because of grace, God doesn't care how you conduct yourself because you've got grace and you can cover it. It matters to God how we conduct our lives. We are people of light and the light should be demonstrated out of our lives. Let me say these few words and tell me what you think of them, or I'll tell you what I think, I suppose, because I'm here with the microphone. But think of these words. Sneaky Christian, dishonest Christian, arrogant Christian, greedy Christian. Surely those are oxymorons. Surely words that do not demonstrate light do not belong next to the word Christian. So I'm just trying to bring this out because Paul spends a lot of time telling us who we are. He spends a lot of time telling us that we have the grace of God, which is something we can never earn. But he's also, in this passage, soon as he says you are people of light, the first thing he says is, be careful how you live. He says, not as unwise, but as wise. So he's saying, if we live in God's ways, that's wise. Psalm says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, we don't even begin to be wise until we know God's ways and live in them. Live as wise, don't live as unwise, live as wise. Now we can get so rigid about right and wrong that we get caught up in legalism and we don't have any grace towards other people or whatever, or even towards ourselves. I've met people who are so legalistic, they cannot, they cannot accept God's grace in their own lives. We do not want to be people who lack grace, because grace is amazing. Grace was the gift that God gave us. But we can get so caught up in the amazingness of amazing grace that we start to think this stuff doesn't really matter to God. It matters to God. It matters to God how we live our lives. It matters to God whether we show his light, whether our lives are a demonstration of his light or not. Paul begins this passage, as I said, by saying, be careful how you live. And he began chapter 4, and you remember chapters 1 to 3 are very focused on who we are. Chapters 4 to 6 in Ephesians are very focused on how we live in who we are. And Paul begins chapter 4 by saying, I urge you to live up to the calling that you have received. So he is very much reiterating, think about how you live. Now here where Paul says, be careful, that word careful isn't be cautious particularly. It isn't about being timid. Remember, Paul said to Timothy, God didn't give you a spirit of fear, and that word is timidity. So God isn't calling us to be timid people and overcautious people. That word careful there carries the sense of examined. Have an examined life. Let's stop and think about our lives. Let's be people who examine ourselves. Now, I'm not talking about becoming really introspective and hung up about everything, but what I mean is let's not just float along through life. Paul's telling us to examine ourselves. Am I living as a person of light? Are there things in my life that are demonstrating not the kingdom of light, but possibly the kingdom I used to live in? Is my life a demonstration of the light of Jesus because Jesus lives within me? See, Paul says here in chapter 2, and this is where we can kind of see the difference, what he's saying. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it tells us, Paul's speaking here, and he says that we are saved by grace. We are saved by grace. It is the gift of God. It is a free gift of God. God has a gift in his hands. He's holding it out, and he's saying, freely take it. Take the gift I have for you. You have my grace. Please Take this gift of grace that's come through Jesus, the power of the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice on the cross of Jesus. Take this free gift that I'm giving to you. Not by works so that we can't boast. I can't say, I'm such a good person, therefore I'm a Christian. That's the beauty of grace. That's the beauty of salvation. It's the great leveller. No one got here by their own ability by their own wonderfulness, by their own goodness. We are all here by the blood of Jesus, by the grace of Jesus. So grace is amazing. Every one of us should take hold of it. It's grace, 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 by faith, all the way for salvation. But then in the very next verse, verse 10 in Ephesians 2, Paul says this, we are God's workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So we are created in Christ Jesus. Remember 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation. Created in Christ Jesus, we are new creations. And so our life should demonstrate that we are a new creation. And then it goes on here and he says, um, uh, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So this is kind of, in my mind at least, this is the timeline. We're in the kingdom of darkness. We say yes to Jesus. We are immediately brought into the kingdom of light. We are justified. We are justified by God. We are standing righteous before God by nothing we do but by the blood of Jesus because he has brought us into the kingdom of light. Once we start living in the kingdom of light, God starts to do a work in us. He is changing us. He is transforming us. He is bringing us more and more into the likeness of Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 calls it going from glory to glory. We are constantly being renewed by God, changed by God to become more and more like Jesus. So to me, that's the timeline of how it works. So we are not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. We are saved to fulfill the purpose of God on earth because we are people of light. Verse 16, Paul goes on. He says, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. There was a lot of dodgy stuff going on in the city of Ephesus to where the church was that Paul's written this to. There was a lot of dodgy stuff and I'm about to tell you some soon. But we might say there's a lot of dodgy stuff going on in our world as well. So yes, we get it, the days are evil. But what is actually meant here by that expression, the days are evil, is that they lived, as do we, in a time before the total rule and reign of Christ on earth. So the devil still has some sway in this earth. The devil still has some power in this earth. As it was then, so it is now. The devil has a certain amount of stuff he's doing on the earth. Otherwise, of course, it wouldn't be so dodgy. So we recognise that. Now, in some translations, it might say, making the most of your time. Some will say making the most of every opportunity. Some will say making the most of your time. The time here is the Greek word kairos. Kairos. Now, that isn't the time as in the ticking of the clock, the passage of time. That's not what that word time there means. That's the Greek word chronos which of course, from which of course we get the word chronological. So we know what chronological means. It's about a measurable set amount of time. That's the Greek word chronos. Like when the Bible speaks chronos, it would say um, God has loved you, he has chosen you, he has planned you since the beginning of time. Psalm 139 says he knit you together in his mother's womb. So we know since the beginning of time, since even before I was born, since even before my parents knew I was coming, and the same with you, God had chosen, God had purposed, God had planned. So that's, a, that's the time or a set period of time. And let's remember when the Bible talks about eternity, it is forever. So it's speaking about time. That is chronos because it is a passage of time. So those two facts alone would make us think if God has planned me before the beginning of time and heaven is forever, if you don't have Jesus, I plead with you. Say yes to Jesus because heaven is going to be a very long time. And so is hell, if I'm allowed to use that word, and it's the 21st century. So we're not talking chronos. Where it says making the most of your time, it isn't speaking of the 24-7 that you have. It's not speaking of the 24 hours we all have in our day. He uses kairos. Now, kairos is about a moment in time. It's about a decision, a moment of decision, a fork in the road, a God-given opportunity. That's what a kairos is. So the difference is, I could say, or a person could say, because this isn't true of me, 
I've been a Christian for the last 10 years. Kronos. Because there's a passage of time. 10 years I have been a Christian. Or I could say on, what's today? on the 11th of October 2010, I became a Christian. So there was a moment on the 11th of October 2010 where I became a Christian. That means there was a moment of decision. There was a fork in the road and I said, I'm going that way, I'm not going that way. It's a moment where we make a decision that takes us in a certain direction. And our lives are full of God-given moments. So this is what Paul is talking about when he uses the word kairos. And he says, make the most of every kairos you get in your life. And you think, well, when's, when's my next kairos? In our lives, we have thousands of kairos moments. I was born in 1964, awesome year, of course. So I'm 56 years old. I'll just say it plainly, why do people lie about their age? I'm 56 years old. If I told you that I'm 40, what would you think? You need to see a surgeon, honey because you look like you're heading towards 60. Is that correct? Yeah. Why do people lie about their age? I only think you're older. So let's get, let it go. So I'm 56. So I have had 56 Kronos years in my life. But in that 56 Kronos years, there have been thousands of Kairos moments where I decide, am I going to do that or am I going to do that? That's what Paul's talking about. My life is full of Kairos. It has been and it will continue to be. And the same for you. Most of you are younger than me, but you have already had thousands of Kairos moments and you will continue to have thousands of Kairos moments in your life. And, and the thing is, they are not necessarily big, life-defining, massive moments. They are moments in our everyday life. The chorus can be small, seeming moments in our everyday life. And Paul says, make the most of every one of those moments. Make the most of the chorus that come into your life. As you're making decisions, even on a daily basis, make the most of them. Make them count for Jesus. Make them count for the kingdom. Because we live in a world where the devil still has power. We live in a world where the devil still has sway. We live in a world where people are broken, people are desperate, and we are people of light. So Paul says, every time the chorus comes, choose, go God's way. Whether it's small, whether it's big, go God's way. And the thing about Kairos is that in a seemingly insignificant small moment of Kairos, there can come a much bigger impact than would originally appear. There may be a decision that you think is small and insignificant and God could make a big impact out of that. Like a Kairos can be, the moment when King David, instead of going with the army and taking his role of leadership in a time of war, his Kairos moment, he decided to relax on a balcony the same time Bathsheba was having a bath. And we see the impact that rolled out of that small Kairos. The, a Kairos moment can be like that moment of decision where 12 spies had to decide, are we going to trust God in this? Or are we going to trust our doubt in this? And that determined whether they got to go into the promised land or not. Our Kairos moments can have rolling impact and rolling effect. It can be a moment when young Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. And the Saviour was born into the world. Our Kairos moments can carry an impact. Sometimes our Kairos moments look very small, they look very insignificant. But if you choose God's way in both the small moments and the big moments, God will use them for redemptive purpose. God will use them for redemptive purpose. I was shoe shopping one day recently. Now it stays in my mind because it's a rare occurrence. reminds me when I was called a blasphemer in Bible college because I didn't agree with what some young man said. But anyway, 
I was going to say good luck team, but we're not luck people, we're blessing people. Anyway, I was shoe shopping. And I went into the shoe store and it was almost closing time. And I was looking at these shoes and I really liked them. And, um, so, and so I was pretty much decided to take them. And then the girl said to me, there was no one else in the store, the assistant was by herself, and she said to me, you know that they're on special. And I said, I can see that they're on special. And she said, they're even more on special. So, Kairos moments bring blessing, Kay, don't they? <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I do trust you. Anyway, so she told me, so the price was less than half the original price, my dear. I'll look in your direction as I say that. <laughs> so, I, as, but as we began to talk, we were just chatting. Now, I guess I was chatty because I'm shoe shopping, I'm in a good mood. That's obvious. So, I'm just, we're just chatting away and she begins to tell me about her day. And we sit down together, because I've been sitting to try on shoes, she sits down next to me and she begins to tell me about her day. And she starts to talk about how she spent her lunch hour crying because of abuse from customers. And as she was telling me, she was almost welling up with tears again. And so I just sat there and I just encouraged her and, and was kind to her. And as, we, as I was paying for my shoes, the fabulously small price, she said to me, I am so glad someone so nice is getting this amazing bargain. Now, of course I'm nice, I've just got great shoes for a good price, but <laughs> here's the thing. I was just shoe shopping and this girl needed some encouragement. She was struggling not to cry at the end of her day at work. She was alone in this shop. She was a fairly young girl. I thought, who leaves someone alone in a shop like this to handle this abusive stuff that comes? See, our Kairos moments can be just almost nothing. It's our day-to-day. -day. It's what we're doing 24-7. It's those little things that happen in life. And Paul says, when a Kairos comes, Make the most for Jesus. It's not about making the most for ourselves and being clever and what can I get out of this. It's make the most for the kingdom of light. We are people of light. Shine your light in your Kairos moment. This is what Paul is saying. Shine your light. Verse 17, it says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. He's still continuing with the same thought. He's still talking about Kairos moments at this time. So he's saying, understand the Lord's will, go the Lord's way, or it's foolish. You're wasting, wasting a kingdom opportunity when we don't choose to go the Lord's way in our Kairos, in our Kairos moment. As I say, it doesn't have to be a big momentous thing. It can be as small as, do I get involved in that conversation? Do I have this conversation that this person needs to have? How do I respond to that unkind behaviour that's just happened to me? How do I respond to that unfair thing that's happening to me at work right now? What do I do in this moment when... This person's doing this or that person's doing that. What do I do in the moment where if I just tell that little lie, it'll be a bit easier for me and I'll get something out of it? What are we doing in those little moments? And Paul says, make it count for the kingdom. If God is calling you to make a faith step, what are you doing? That's a Kairos moment. It's a fork in the road moment. Are you going to choose, I'm going God's way? Or are you going to say, I think I'd prefer to trust and obey my doubts? Verse 18, and this is the last verse we're going to look at today. Verse 18, it says this, because I haven't written it down here for myself. So when I say one, two, three, everybody read this for me. One, two, three. Wow, that was, a, that was impressive. Wow. Okay, someone read verse 18 for me, please. Thank you. Thank you, David. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to, to debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. You might have noticed that here Paul is taking us along a path of contrast. You may have picked that up as we've been going. He says, not as unwise, but as wise. Do not be foolish, 
understand the Lord's will. And now he's saying, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. In this comparison, Paul is specifically referencing something that they would have understood very well. Paul is specifically referencing something that ha was happening in the city that they were in. Because many of the um, Christians in the Ephesian church had come out of a pagan religion centred around drunkenness and orgies. It was centred around drunken orgies in which a person tried to progressively elevate themselves into communion with the gods, or particularly with one god. The city of Ephesus was the centre of the cult of Dionysus, also known as Bacchus. You may have heard the god Bacchus, or you may have heard Dionysus, or be happy if you haven't heard either of them. But this was the god of wine. And what the people would do, they would gather together, they would get as drunk as they could get, they would have orgies and stuff, they would get as drunk as they could get because they believed in their drunkenness, the god of wine would take control of their body because they were like out of control in their drunkenness. And as he controlled their body, they were being elevated into who he was. They were being elevated into the place where this god of wine lived. It would elevate them. So they were seeking a spiritual experience. They are seeking spiritual fulfilment by having these drunken parties. And in fact, it's the word where we get, it's the original language where we get the word symposium from. The Greek word is something like symposium. So, and the word symposium literally means drunken party or drinks party. So we won't be having symposiums at church, we'll do seminars, we'll do conferences, but probably not the word symposium ever again. But Paul says, don't do that. Be filled with the Spirit. You have a choice. Are you going to be filled with, uh, what does he say, do not get drunk on wine because you're trying to make a connection with this God of wine or are you going to be filled with the Spirit to make a connection with the one true God? So he says, don't do that. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, that word filled there, it's not meaning quantity. That word in the Greek, pleural, again, apologies, but it is, actually means to be fulfilled. It speaks of completion, finding fulfillment. So Paul says... Don't get drunk on the wine because what that's leading to is debauchery. So he's saying you're not actually finding any fulfilment there. You're trying to find fulfilment. You're trying to find completeness. You're trying to have a spiritual experience. And if you think about it, that's hardly a modern thing. You've got to understand, we've got to understand, back then people were trying to find spiritual experiences. We live in a world now where people are trying to find spiritual experiences. They will go to places, they will listen to this. I'm on Facebook in our local community and people are talking about all different kinds of groups which are about spiritual experiences because they're trying to find a way for fulfilment in their lives. And we now live in a time, as Paul did, when people are beginning to recognise that spirituality is where they want to find their fulfilment. But Paul says, don't be going down those paths because it's empty. But be filled with the Spirit because when you're filled with the Spirit, you are completed. You are fulfilled. Who you are meant to be comes to its fullness. It's the same base word as is used about Jesus in Colossians 2.9 where it says Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead. So what it's saying is Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead and as we get filled with the Spirit and it's a continual thing, it's not speaking of a one-off, it's a thing of always being filled with the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit, we also will find that fullness and that completion that God offers to us in Jesus. It doesn't mean that we are the fullness of God because we are not gods, but it means we will be fulfilled in everything that God has for us, in everything that he wants us to be. We find our fulfillment in the spirit instead of trying to search in all these other areas to find some sort of spiritual fulfillment, something that makes us feel okay. We find this all in God. Find your fulfilment in being filled 
with the Holy Spirit. So this is what Paul has been saying to the church that we've gone through this morning. He says, not as unwise, be wise. Now when there's a B, it's fairly obvious, that means we can choose that. See, we're all born with intelligence and some people are born with more intelligence than others. You know, we all have a certain IQ. Apparently, I've never done the test. I'm too scared. But we all are born with intelligence. But wisdom is something that can grow. We all know people who are very intelligent but may not be living a wise life. So I don't worry too much if I'm super intelligent or not. I ask God for wisdom. I regularly pray and say, God, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom as a wife. Give me wisdom as a mother. Give me wisdom as a pastor. Give me wisdom as a friend. Because we can grow in wisdom. And Paul says, be wise. Be a person who chooses to grow and be wise. Don't be unwise. He says, don't be foolish. Understand the Lord's will. In your kairos moments, in your kairos moments, what would God want me to do right now? If I go that way, I've wasted it. I've wasted it. That's what Paul is calling foolish. And don't get drunk on wine. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. We need to continually be connecting with God so his Spirit is there. He's fulfilling us and filling us and filling us with his Spirit because we are people of light. And we want the light of Jesus, not the light of my goodness. That's nowhere near good enough. We want the light of Jesus shining out of us. And when we are filled with the Spirit, our lives will be a full demonstration that we belong to the God of light. Amen. So welcome. We're going to come to a time of announcements right now. Um, so we still have things going on in the church. We might be restricted, but there are some amazing things happening. So ladies, women, this is one for you. Next Saturday, we have our Flourish Day Conference. Yes, I think we need to cheer because this, this is a big one. Normally, we go away for the weekend, and unfortunately, we can't do that this year. But that does not mean that God is moving does not mean that God doesn't have a plan to move and transform our hearts. So that is next Saturday, starting at 2 p.m., finishing around 7.30, but who knows what's going to happen with the move of God. So please come. Afternoon tea will be provided as well as dinner. Um, it'll just be a fabulous afternoon. So $15, please see either Pastor Pavey or myself to register for that event. We still do need numbers. And, of course, as Pastor Pavey has said previously, cost is an issue. Please come and see us anyway. Okay. Connect groups, we are still meeting across the western suburbs and we are meeting online. So there is no excuse nowadays not to be connected. So if you'd like to join a connect group, please see Pastor Randall. He can provide you with further details. But just so that you're aware, nowadays you don't even need to leave your house. It is preferable that you're not in your pyjamas, but we'll probably even accept that as well. So it's all good. So connect with Pastor Randall with that one. And then we have, well, look, on the screen, it's all the ways that you can give. This is an extremely generous church. You're an amazing, you're an amazing blessing, not only the house, but to God. So we thank you for that. And we just try and make it easy for you to give as well. So you can go online to our website. You can make direct deposits. We also are now using the Tithely app as well. And if you're not sure how that works, but you'd like to try it out, please come and see one of us, myself or Pastor Randall. We will give you the lowdown on that app as well. So we just like to encourage you to keep in contact with us. Um, you can do that through our Facebook page. We like to keep you up to date through that. We do have a YouTube channel as well, Riverside Church channel, where you can always go back and listen to any of our um, previous messages. And also check out our website as well. So we will keep you updated as much as we can through this time.